last time we looked at the at the canto of uh, canto 15 of inferno the canto of brunetto the teacher of dante's teacher and the teacher of the florentines and we um, and we pointed out the 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 rhetoric of the canto after all brunetto is a master rhetorician uh, so it was quite appropriate that Dante's account of his meeting with his uh, teacher uh, would be carried out through uh, a careful, very careful uh, highlighting of uh, the ambiguities of language, the way a language is used very carefully to mean one thing for one order of experience, Brunettos, for instance, uh, anthropocentric political understanding of the world and then uh, Dante's own understanding of the world which we could call theological but it really means uh, the point of view of someone who is questing who is moving and who will move beyond uh, Brunetto and how a language oscillates the same words seem to acquire different meanings in uh, those different contexts and in many ways that language would become, uh, the language, the rhetoric, which should be the instrument of persuasion and agreement, becomes in and of itself the cause of two of misunderstandings uh, between them, between master and, uh, and disciple. Uh, but uh, the, the Canto of Brunetto, for all of its uh, the intensity and poignancy of a personal uh, confrontation of, uh, of, uh, of a disciple who meets his teacher and in many ways shows even there there's a, so, a great deal of ambivalence uh, a great deal of uh, acknowledgement recognition of the importance of Brunetto's teaching on him uh, but at the same time uh, a sort of distance taking leave taking from uh, uh, that teaching uh, that too, though, for all its private uh, quality, the quality of uh, the great humanistic values of uh, acknowledging uh, uh, the, a teaching that shows the way to how man makes himself eternal. That is as anthropocentric as it can be, that kind of, uh, of, of, of uh, aphorism, in a way, which is, which is the way Dante uh, seals the personality of Reto. And yet, it always had or actually has as always this 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 exp and personal encounters do in Dante a, a political focus it was something a little bit larger than their own private story it is the the encounter between them was placed within the crisis of Florence uh, the city of Florence the divisions between Welves and uh, Ghibellines and then there is also the announcement uh, to, Brunet, uh, to, to Dante by Brunetto that he is going to go into, he's going to end up uh, in, in, in exile. Uh, that the comfort, uh, the human bonds, the comfort of the city and family and whatnot, even that will be denied to him. Uh, for Brunetto, of course, there is also a strategy of uh, uh, thinking that Dante's own experience is, is really the mirror image of his own. Because as you remember, and I said this at the beginning of my remarks last time, Brunetto also experiences uh, uh, exile as he was in Roncesvall, uh, the, the, the classical place of the most traumatic experience in uh, medieval history, the, the, the place where the paladin Roland, uh, Orlando in Italian, Roland, uh, and, and the Carolingian drama, the Charlemagne soldiers are defeated. And Brunetto, that's where he, he, that's how he views his own defeat in the, uh, in the city of Florence. So there was always a public focus. And the public focus was not just a context for their relationship, but the, it, 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 it was really a way of uh, shedding light on the very nature of their own divisions. Uh, it is as if uh, the oscillations of language uh, that they experience in the exchange between them uh, are really a consequence also of larger divisions, uh, larger suspicions that these uh, characters living in Florence entertain toward each other. I mention that because I'm going to move today 
to Canto 19, we have taken quite a jump. We went through 16. We saw the flight on the back of Jerion, or some, some, some uh, adumbration of that flight on the back of Jerion. Uh, uh, canto 17, uh, if you were to read it on your own, it's an extraordinary canto. It's the only time that Virgil leaves Dante alone. And Dante has to uh, uh, meet the, uh, the, the, the usurers. And, he had, and it is as if uh, he had to be left without any guidance. It is as if he had to discover by himself and by his own powers what those temptations are and what the implications of usury would be for him. And, and, and there may be a, a biographical, uh, biographical resonance there in the sense that uh, uh, not only the poet is uh, edging uh, toward the, the, the condition of the usurer uh, engaged in illusory recreations, illusory productions, but also a biographical uh, reference to, to uh, Dante's own father, who was engaged in that sort of, uh, of activity. And then we go through uh, Canto 19, which is really the canto that I want to talk about now. And that's the point of my re remarks about uh, my, my recapitulations of uh, what I said about, about Brunetto. Dante now takes a public voice. Not only he takes a, so you have a, a, uh, an experience of the shifts in his own voice. You, you do know the kind of romance atmosphere and the encounter with, uh, uh, with, with Francesca. Uh, you do have the kind of uh, the seminar-like uh, tones that he uses in the encounter in limbo with the poets of antiquity, where he, they go on talking about, about art and the secrets of the craft, etc. Now Dante takes what I, I, has it, I do not hesitate to call a prophetic voice. A pub, he plays now, he sees himself as a public role. The shift or the, the, the change, the departure from uh, uh, the political rhetorical tone uh, used in the, in the encounter with, uh, with Brunetto could not be more, could not be sharp or more radical. This is, uh, 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 this is uh, uh, an argument now that engages him. Uh, as a public figure, as it were, indeed as a prophet. So what does it mean to be a prophet for Dante? What kind of, how can one take on this sort of, uh, of, of uh, voice? How does one go on, to, how, how, how does a prophet uh, talk like? Uh, one thing that you may want to keep in mind as I go on uh, to understand this canto is that if clearly the, the pattern uh, for all of this, the model would be to be the prophetic voice in the Bible, the biblical prophets. And do not make a mistake of thinking for a moment that prophets are those who uh, foretell the future. That's not really their role. In fact, Dante goes out of the way, and I'm not going to talk about that, we really haven't got time, in Canto 20, uh, highlighting the differences, as it were, between prophets and diviners. The diviners are those who foretell, predict the future. So if the prophets do not foretell the future, what do they do? They are literally readers of the present. This is the, the point. For Dante, the biblical prophets are those who read the present history in its unfolding from the perspective of what they perceive to have been God's promise to Israel and to them. So the prophets are in a way, and I, do not, I don't say this in any way to, to, uh, to degrade them, but I, on, the, on the contrary, to highlight the importance of their intervention into the present, that you could call them as commentators, those who are, in, in the true sense of the word, those who remember. That's what a commentator is. A commentator is, is an exercise of memory, a way of bringing ancient memories to bear on the present. That's the way Dante understands the prophetic, uh, prophetic voice. Another little detail before we go on with the canto. You do not know, some of you may know, that Dante actually is a writer of many epistles. He was a letter writer. We do not know the letters he wrote on behalf of his patrons, but we do know the, the letters that he wrote in his own name. And he would be uh, writing letters that the, the array of which is, uh, can be sometimes moving, uh, for instance, when he writes to a friend, uh, he would like to attend the funeral of uh, this friend's wife and cannot. He's uh, practically begging. 
because he doesn't have the adequate clothes to go to the funeral and introduce himself. He's clearly begging for some kind of uh, assistance. But he writes also letters that probably never reached the destination. He wrote letters, for instance, to the Italian cardinals who were uh, in conclave. You, you understand what, I'm, what I mean when I say conclave. The conclave means that they are shut under key and kept in some place where they can make decisions about electing from within themselves or from the outside a pope. And they could not agree about whom to choose. So he writes a letter, a letter to the Italian cardinals. And he begins the letter uh, addressing them and saying, perhaps all of you will wonder, who is this man? Who gives him the authority to say, to speak to us and address us and spur us on to action? Doesn't he remember, this is Dante speaking, and attributing these thoughts to the cardinals, the, the possible objection to the intervention of a layman's voice within sacred things. Doesn't he remember the lesson of the biblical prophet, which he doesn't mention, uh, the name that's mentioned, who on seeing the ark of the, of the alliance being carried into, into the city of Jerusalem and seeing the ark tottering, he stretches his hand trying to protect it, to, to, to make sure that it won't co collapse and, 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 and break into pieces, and God intervenes and, and through lightning and fulminates him and kills him. So Dante is aware of the danger of taking on. That's the point. He goes on saying, spurring them, saying, I'm not really touching the ark, I'm really spurring the oxen who are not going anywhere. That's the, the substance of the letter, but this does not concern us here. But the point that concerns us here is that in the background to this canto where he takes on the prophetic voice, he's aware of the possible profanation that he is engaged in, in addressing as he does the so-called Simonists. It's time to get into the canto of the so-called Simonists. Who are the Simonists? Um, in fact, let me just, uh, I was just reading this little story, the sisters, of, of Joyce, I, I have been reading that before, but I know that that is really a story of, I don't know how many of you are uh, English uh, uh, students, uh, students of English literature, but he writes this story, this is which really about a sort of 20, early 20th century version of, uh, of Simone. And if some one of you might want to write a paper uh, connecting uh, the sisters, this beautiful gem of a story by Joyce, and Canto 19, you can, and you see the differences. That, they are, uh, that between the two of them. The Simonists are uh, the followers. It's, it's, uh, it's a word, uh, like we say, the Machiavellians, for instance, are the followers of Machiavelli, or those who think like Machiavelli. The Simonists are the followers of Simon, who was uh, called a magus, or a sorcerer, or a magician, Simon, uh, Simon. And actually, we call this phenomenon when you have a name that gives, sort of creates uh, a trend or a way of thinking. It's called an eponym. Uh, just, I thought that you might, from the Greek, eponym. This is an eponym. Simonists are the followers of uh, Simon, uh, the magician. So it's Dante's beginning, um, the story, um, with uh, a reference to a founding event in the uh, constitution of the church. Goes back to the Acts of the Apostles, where there is this story that of, of a sorcerer, a man engaged in witchcraft, in illusions, Simon, who wants to buy the gift of prophecy and the power of making miracles from Peter. And therefore then he challenges him to, let's see who can fly, etc., and then they go up on a tower and try to fly. Simon, of course, will go down and will die. What Dante is doing, he's now encountering the popes of his own time. Nicholas V, Boniface VIII, one of the great minds, a great jurist, by the way. Uh, in fact, there are those historians who really think that Dante is, is uh, bad-mouthing him, that you know, there's some, something personal that we, we can't quite see. Boniface VIII and Clement VI, the fifth, I'm sorry, the three popes uh, under whom Dante lived, who are engaged in simony. What is simony? It's a sacrilege. 
Simony is the act, exactly like Simon in the Acts of the Apostles, who wanted to buy the gift of prophecy. It is a sin whereby one can go on in making commerce of sacred things and thereby engaging in blasphemy. The question then is, what does Dante think the sacred is? It's a constant <coughs> theme in his, uh, in his reflections. It's a constant theme of his thoughts. Uh, what is the sacred? How do we determine it? How, what does it mean to violate the sacred? Simon violates the sacred. The popes now, who are uh, of his own generation, are engaged in the same kind of <coughs> blasphemy, in the same kind of profanation. And in effect, let me just give you a little detail that you might appreciate this ambiguity. The other name of Peter, you know, St. Peter, the guy with the two keys, we saw an allusion to him with Canto 13. The other name of Peter is Simon. So in fact, he's known as Simon Peter. It is as if by having these two, the, 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 the sorcerer, the magician called Simon, and the pope called Simon Peter, and they should be, uh, whose successors these popes should be, the first pope and the other, he's, Dante is actually uh, uh, giving us a sense of what we call, forgive them the, the rhetorical term, a metonymic. Uh, proximity, a contiguity, a nearness between them. The nearness between the prophetic mode and uh, the profanation of the prophetic mode. How, how precarious is the boundary line that divides the two? How precarious is the divide line that, that separates the, the, the sacred from the profanation of the sacred? So this is really what Dante is doing. Let's see how he dramatizes all of this. First of all, then, the question that I raised with you is, how do prophets talk? And one thing that you will see here is the apostrophe. This is a canto written in terms of apostrophes. Look at this. Um, and we read the canto. So I'm reading the canto. This is for the transcriber. Uh, um, canto <clears throat> 19. Ah, Simon Magos. You see, there is the apostrophe. Think about why the apostrophe? What is an apostrophe? Hmm. And you, his wretched followers, who rapacious prostitute for gold and silver, the things of God which should be brides of righteousness. Yeah, that's the definition of simony. Uh, viewed as an adultery, a corruption, therefore, of the chastity of... of uh, of the marriage uh, between God and the soul, now must the trumpet sound for you, for your place in, is in the third pouch. We were now at the next tomb and had climbed to that part of the ridge which hangs right over the middle of the ditch. Oh, another apostle, another invocation, we call it, but it's, it's, I'm, I'm not so sure that we can quite, that I can quite uh, decide the difference between an invocation, which is obviously a prayerful, and an apostrophe, a calling on, an address. Uh, that's what the apostrophe is. How great is the art that shows in heaven, on earth, and in the evil world, and how justly does that power dispense. I saw along the sides, and on the bottom, the livid stone full of holes, all of one size, and each was round. They seemed to me of a width no more or less than those that were made in my beautiful St. John, the baptistry of St. John in Florence. And these are this, uh, the, the, the wells where baptisms take place. They're usually octagonal in shape. It was the eighth day, you know, the, 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 uh, the idea that the resurrection is on the eighth day. Uh, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's the, the idea of history based on the seven days of creation, uh, the eighth day of the resurrection. They were made in my beautiful St. John as fonts for baptism, one of which, not many years ago, I broke for one that was drowning in it. And to this, I set my seal to clear the mind of everyone. What Dante is doing is acknowledging what could, what could have been seen as an act of profanation. He broke one, which is really is a figurative because they are huge, and I can't believe that he could have the uh, really 10 people to, to break these things apart. 
Uh, so it's a figurative idea that he stretched his hand into holy things and violated the holy things. But he did it, and that's the excuse he's giving. Uh, he did it in order to save someone's life. So there is nothing gratuitous, that's the point, in his own intervention, as it is called. It's called an interventio in sacris stretching the profane hands into holy things, into sacred things. He, what, what, he's, what he's really uh, removing himself uh, from is the charge that his act may appear purely gratuitous. And if it's not gratuitous, what is it uh, driven by? Where does it come from? If it's not, one can say, well, it's a gratuitous act, which means you can dismiss it, but this is not gratuitous. So what is the reason behind it? And he, he, if, if he's serious enough, he should provide us this reason. From the mouth of each projected, of each projected the feet of a sinner, and the legs as far as the calf, and the rest was inside. He's representing the popes who are here, upside down. That's the way, that's the way Simon fell. And I have a little story about that too. It was also the position that according to legend, St. Peter wanted for himself. He asked that he be buried upside down because he wanted to show what the true direction of, for the soul's ascent and purification would be. The idea that we're in, remember, in an inverted world, a world which is upside down, and therefore to be with a head down, you, you, you are really uh, right side up. You are going toward, uh, toward your proper destination. So Dante here is playing with this iconographic motif of Peter who asks to be crucified ups with the head upside down and the story of Simon who very much like him now is as a, as a, as, as, as a punishment is with uh, the head upside down. How are they punished? In an overt parody of the Pentecosts and the flames of fire. You know the story of the Pentecost. That's the story of the Pentecost. It's the story of the gift of language that come down as a rain of fire on them. Now they have flames on their feet. Uh, this is what, this is the sort of uh, uh, horrible uh, turning around of, uh, of prophecy and of the, of, the, of the gift of languages, meaning that we all speak everybody else's language, which clearly means I'm sure that there are the polyglots among you, but it clearly means that we all speak one language, the language of charity, and therefore we can all understand each other uh, that way. So uh, that's uh, that they would have snapped with his uh, and ropes as flames on oily thing, on oily things, the oil of unction. Uh, so it's a further allusion to the desecration that is taking place here. Moves only over the outer surface. So it did there from the heels to the toe. Who is that one? Dante asks, wants to know who it is uh, that he's his master that rides in his torment more than any of his fellows, I said, and is licked by a red flame. And he answered me, if thou will have me carry thee down there by that more sloping bank, thou shalt know from himself of him and of his misdeeds. And I, all is well for me that is thy pleasure. Thou art my Lord, and knowest that I depart not from thy will. Thou knowest too what I do not speak. Then we came on to the fourth dike, turned and descended on our left down to the pitted and narrow bottom. And the good master did not set me down from his haunch till he brought me to a hole of him that so lamented with his shanks. Whoever, whoever thou art, I began, unhappy soul that are held upside down, planted like a post. If thou art able, speak. And now the series of inversions is introduced here. I, Dante says, stood there like the friar. You see, he is the layman, the changing of roles. And the pope, who is going to be unveil his own, reveal his own identity in a moment, he is there. Uh, like an assassin, he was called like a, an assassin, a perfidious assassin, meaning the one who broke faith. That's what the word uh, perfidy uh, means, that shrives the treacherous Ita Italian is the perfido, as an assassin who, after being fixed, calls him back so that he, he delays his death, and he cried. This is the one of the popes, Nicholas, 
he misunderstands that the misunderstanding is highly suggestive. He's telling Dante and us that the reigning pope, while Dante is writing, Boniface VIII, one of the Orsini family, one of the great families, Roman families, has already arrived. And he says, standest thou there already? Standest thou there already, Boniface? By several years, the writing lied to me. Are thou so soon sated with these gains for which thou did not fear to take that by Gaia, the Lady Beautiful, and then do her outrage? So uh, this is uh, uh, the, coming, coming, the, the accusation that Dante can launch at the, the figures of power. The prophet who takes on uh, power and unveils its, its abuses. I became like those that stand as if mocked, uh, not comprehending the reply made to them and know not what to answer. And Virgil said, tell him quickly, I'm not he, I'm not he that thou thinkest. And I answered as if, as I was bitten. At that, the spirit twisted his feet together, then sighing and with a lamenting voice, he said to me, what dost thou want with me then? If to know who I am concerns thee so much that has come down the bank for it, know that I was invested with a great mantle and so on. And Dante will go on into uh, a, a general attack, uh, which is really the, the prophetic moment. Let me just, uh, I do not know, I'm reading from lines 90 and following, I do not know if uh, on that I was overbold when all my answer to him was in the strain. Pray, tell me now, how much treasure did our Lord require of St. Peter before he gave the keys into his charge? Surely he has nothing but follow me, nor did Peter on the other take gold or silver from Matthias, and so on. So this is Dante now, uh, the prophet. Dante, the, the, the man who speaks because, and he, he feels that he ought to speak, and that's the distance taken from the gratuitousness of the accusation, because all figures of authority are lacking. In the presence of this eclipse of authority, he thinks that it is incumbent upon him to go on taking that authority. It's a usurpation of, of a voice, a usurpation of authority in order to make up for what he thinks is missing. And the problem, uh, this whole question about the, the, the confusion of orders, the confusion between the uh, secular and the sacred, the profane and the sacred, is brought back to one great event, which was known in the Middle Ages as the second sin of Adam. It was so great to understand what the first sin of Adam was, the transgression, uh, the transgression of the, the command uh, uh, given to him not to eat of the tree, of the, 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 the forbidden tree, uh, the forbidden fruit of the tree. Uh, the event that Dante goes back to is the event of the so-called donation of Constantine, about which I want to say a few things, and then we move on to the next cantos. And so the, it's the donation of Constantine. It, is, it refers to the fourth century when the emperor Constantine, whose name I think I have mentioned, uh, uh, gave, extended, gave the land to the pope. Ex in other words, made the pope the ruler of a secular um, domain. To Dante, this was a confusion of registers, a confusion of responsibilities, that the pope should be only engaged in spiritual pursuits and spiritual matters. He becomes instead involved in secular matters. So the sin of simony is really the problem between uh, the has to do with the donation of Constantine. An issue, by the way, and I, I will tell you why this is important in a second, the issue is, will be really clarified around the 15th century when two, figure, two people, two figures, one is Cusanus, some of you may know him, uh, Nicholas of Cusa, went on repeating the moral arguments against the donation of Constantine as much as Dante does here. But the one who really proved the falseness of the documents with which uh, 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 Constantine supposedly made the donation to, to the, the Pope who was Lorenzo Valla with a philologist 
who went on examining the language of that text, and by examining that language, found out that, this, that, 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 that the, the donation was not written, the document had not possibly been written in the fourth century because it, it bore the traces of 11th century uh, Latin. And so he went on specifying that that donation had been a forgery, and the forgery had been committed in, in, a, in, a, in a convent in the south of France with extraordinary linguistic precision. What is the, why is this important to Dante? Dante makes this issue of the donation of Constantine, the confusion of orders, the spiritual and the secular, which Simone embodies, which Simone uh, crystallizes the real problem of uh, the, the crisis of his own time. So, so huge, I repeat that it's called as the second sin of Adam. Dante wrote a political text called Monarchia, which is really an argument in favor of the, uh, the separation between these two orders, the church and the state, uh, had to be neatly divided, both to protect the state from the intrusions of the church and to protect the church from the likely intrusions of the state. So it's really an argument that goes into, in two, two directions. Uh, so much then for Canto 19. The last thing I have to say is I, I began talking about the rhetoric of the prophets. I said the prophets really um, uh, use apostrophes. Apostrophes, which are forms of lament, ah, Simon, you can see it's a, a kind of mourning. Uh, it's the language of, uh, of, 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 of grief, prim primarily. But there is also, from a linguistic point of view, something else about an apostrophe. Because an apostrophe it's, has an indeterminacy of its own. It's not really language. It says nothing. It's, like, it's a scream. But it's a, 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 the sense of a need to break the silence. In other words, you uh, use an apostrophe or, or emit a cry because you cannot be quiet. And that's really exactly what makes this aspect of prophetic language so crucial. It's between silence, one is overcome by what one, the, the enormity of what one sees, and the refusal to acquiesce. So, uh, and, and, and I could give you, ah, Constantine, that's another apostrophe that we saw. So the whole canto is punctuated by this rhetorical form that wants to break the silence and, and, and cannot quite find the words. That's what I call the indeterminacy of uh, the rhetorical artifice. Um, let me just go, uh, I know that I said I would read 21, maybe I can talk about it. I, I have to say very little about comedy. Dante uses the language of comedy, and what I, had, I, uh, had we time, I would talk about how Dante goes out of the way, 21, to this here now I, my comedy, the language, the humble style. Uh, it is as if he wants to free himself from uh, the shackle, the complications of using a lofty language, or taking on this extraordinary position of being, being the prophet of his own times. So he goes on to say, my comedy. But this comedy is also linked to a peculiar experience in, that he tells in Canto 21, the fear of falling. The devils are after him, and the, the devils, uh, the, 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 of course, he calls them uh, Welfs and Ghibellines. Another way of thinking about them was the war between, he says, whites and blacks, bianchi and neri. It's, that's the way they would distinguish themselves. So these demons are his enemies, are the blacks, the, 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 uh, the Ghibellines, who are trying to throw him down. And the point is that comedy is always attached to, always flanked with the idea of a f the fall. Uh, laughter, it is, as, it, as it were, begins at the moment when someone falls, someone slips. And, and so we could really talk about that had a little bit more, but not much more, had a chance to, if we had a little bit more time. But I'm anxious to get into 26. And before we get to 26, there is a passage in Canto 25 that I have to read. Dante has been going through the realm of the thieves, Canto 24 and 25. And he is overwhelmed by the metamorphosis, the, the form of punishment of these thieves. Uh, that go on changing um, form, they become snakes, they are human beings bitten by snakes, they become snakes, they turn into ashes, and they recompose themselves in an endless cycle. This is the punishment. And Dante goes on, writing as a poet, breaking the flow 
of the narrative of what is happening to him, and this is what he says. He, uh, this is on Canto 25, 25 uh, lines 90 and following. He, he describes the, uh, actually reading from lines 8 and following, as the lizard under the great scourge of the dog days, passing from hedge to hedge, seems lightening, if it crossed the way, so appeared, making for the bellies of the other two a small, fiery serpent, livid and black as a peppercorn. And that part by which we, were, we first received our nourishment, it transfixed in one of them, then fell down before him stretched out. The one transfixed stared at it, but said nothing, only stood still and yawned, as if sleep or fever had come upon him. He kept looking at the serpent and it at him, the, on, the one from the wound, the other from the mouth, smoked violently, and the smoke met. And now here is Dante talking as a poet. He breaks the account, the, the chronicle of what he has seen, the witnessing, since that's what he is. He's the witness in all his experiences. And, there, and that's what he says. Let Lucan now be silent with his tales of wretched Sabellius and Asidius, and let him wait to hear what now comes forth. Let Ovid be silent about Cadmus and Aretusa, for if in his lines he turns him into a serpent and her into a fountain, I do not grudge it to him. For two natures, face to face, he never so transmuted that both kinds were ready to exchange their substance. All right. On the face of it, Dante is saying that the kind of metamorphosis he's describing really is um, more horrifying than anything that Ovid, the author of the Metamorphosis, uh, who is always guided in his metamorphosis by a belief in the, in the bondage, in the bond of, uh, of, in the solidarity between humans, human beings and the natural world. We can go on shifting forms and there is a kind of serene uh, transformation happening in, in, uh, in, 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 uh, in Ovid. And he also, he also says that he's different from Lucan, another author of, uh, in, in, of, meta of uh, scenes of metamorphosis in his story about the Civil War. But the point that I, that I think is really crucial here is a, is a different one. Dante is repeating, reenacting exactly the kind of aesthetic temptation that we already witnessed in Canto IV of Inferno in Limbo, where Dante meets the poets and he's so taken, so complacent about undoubtedly the great temptation of being sitting, sitting with, uh, can you imagine, Homer, Virgil, Horace, Lucan, Ovid, exactly the people that he mentioned them. Retrospectively, that scene of harmony that Canto IV seemed to dramatize now completely, is completely vanquished. No, here he is, he's really saying, I am their rival. I am even better. I'm seeing things that they didn't even imagine. So if you had the illusion of an idyllic relationship among poets, uh, you are disabused at this point. But it is a temptation nonetheless, because once again, Dante is going down for in, 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 an in a descent, which is a descent of spiritual humility, and yet his voice seems to be going up in an opposite direction, one of hubris. The same kind of temptation that he had in Canto IV. And this is what happens. Again, the structure repeats itself. In Canto IV, Dante claims that he uh, fellowship with the great poets. He comes into Canto V, and he has to confront the responsibilities of writing, the responsibilities of being a writer. Uh, and he encounters his own, a reader of his own. Dante emerges into Canto XXVI and meets none other than Ulysses, a master rhetorician, whose experience and whose journey will lead himself and his uh, companions to a tragic end. For Dante, this is a, an extraordinary moment for a number of reasons. Ulysses is a steady point of reference for his own adventure. Uh, he will keep thinking of him in Canto 19 of Purgatorio and in Canto 28 of Paradise. When Dante is about to live beyond the whole, the, the physical universe, he looks back to see the distance he has traveled, and the only thing that he sees is really that passageway where Ulysses violated 
of boundaries. Clearly, what kind of boundaries am I violating? Ulysses is a mode of being, a possibility of being for Dante himself. And so we come into Canto 26, and I would like to take as much time as we possibly can without tiring you all uh, about uh, this canto. Let me begin with, uh, as a sort of preamble, tell you a general, a general, a general point. Every school child in antiquity and in Dante's own time knew one thing, that Ulysses was a famous Greek hero, polytropic, as Homer calls him, the man of many terms, the man who knew it all, the man who had been seasoned in all experiences. They know that he had gone to the war of Troy, that he was the one to suggest the building of the Trojan horse and the stealing of the Palladium, as you know, the simulacrum of Minerva wisdom, the figure of the, the image of wisdom. And then it took him that he was involved in uh, the battle about inheriting Achilles' arms with Ajax. And then we, everybody knew that it took him 10 years to return to Ithaca, right? This is the story of the Odyssey. He returns, he goes to, we do know only the, 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 the Nostos, as the Greeks call, call it, the return, the journey of return. He becomes the hero of nostalgia, the going back to a place that he has. Everybody knew this in, uh, in, Dante, in antiquity and in Dante's time. In antiquity, they knew it very well because then the story of Ulysses had become an allegory, a philosophical allegory of the fate of the soul. The idea of Ulysses who goes from Ithaca to Troy and then go, goes back for 10 years, after a war of 10 years, another 10 years of vicissitudes, cleansing himself in order to reach, to go back to, uh, and, 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 and testing himself to, to go back to his hometown. Uh, was really the story of the soul. That's what the soul does. It incarnates itself, strophe and epistrophe. It goes uh, through, the soul goes through uh, the planets and gets tainted by the attributes of the, of the planets. Some of us are lunatics, others are mercurial, others are Saturnine, you know, that's from the planets. But then by cleansing ourselves, the soul can go back to its place of origin. That's the circle of the return. That's, that's the way the Alexandrian Neoplatonists understood the allegory of the Odyssey. So this is clear. Dante violates this rule. That's what you have in Canto 26. Dante begins with Ulysses' who has return to Ithaca and starts his journeys of exploration all over again. The idea of the eternal return, the idea of a closure, that he has come back home is no, not part of Dante's imagination or sensibility. He is, he is the poet who is truly restless and always placing himself and his heroes on some kind of quest, on a method, on a road, on an address, whatever, whatever the, the, the idea. Uh, the philosophers were always on the road, always in thinking about some, some, some way of reaching wisdom, reaching truth. That's what he puts them. And that's what happens with the story of, uh, of, of Ulysses. Ulysses uh, starts all over again and goes and die, to die. He's involved in a journey that is absolutely gratuitous, a journey for wisdom, a journey for wisdom into the unpeopled world. We're going to see this in a moment. And, and dies. That's, that's, that's it. From one point of view, and I want you to be careful as you read the canto, because you will see, uh, you will notice one thing. The first thing you will notice is it's not Dante who conducts the interview with Ulysses. No, it is Virgil, the poet of Latin antiquity, and supposedly they speak maybe Greek or some form of uh, clearly Greek. Um, uh, it is Virgil, the poet of the Aeneid, who thinks of himself as the fitting interlocutor of the great Greek hero, not Dante. Dante is excluded. Dante just watches and witnesses this. But there is more to this idea of stylistic decorum, because one can say, well, Virgil, this is in fact tr as tragic as a text can ever get, sublime. This is not a comical text. This is Virgil, the author of a tragedy. That's how Dante calls it, the tragic style, the sublime style. And Ulysses speaks. 
in the most, in the loftiest way possible. But it's not just a question of stylistic decorum. At stake, there is something else. Ulysses disguises himself as Aeneas, as, and tells the story of his life as if he were Aeneas. Now, let me just tell you one little thing, and then we get into the canto. Uh, and, and this is part of the story in many ways. If you ask readers of Virgil and Homer, they probably will tell you, well, Virgil, yeah, good poet, but you know, let's face it, the first six books are just the Odyssey, and the second books are just the Iliad that he sort of gives a, a resume of and so on. Not at all, not at all. And the difference between the two heroes is this. Ulysses is a place to go back to. He goes from Ithaca to Troy, back to Ithaca. Aeneas has no place to go to. His is the open quest, the, open, the, the road on open-ended road and open-ended journey. And this is the way Ulysses will think of himself. The, third, the last thing, and then uh, really we'll uh, get into the camp. The last thing I'll say is that the extraordinary ambiguity, I want to point out, the extraordinary amb ambiguity with which Dante represents Ulysses. But the ambiguity of Ulysses is part of the story of Ulysses from the start. The very, from the very beginning, Ulysses is a philosopher and he's a rhetorician. He's someone who can manipulate all knowledge for his own ends. And this is this, this ambiguity that in many ways Dante is, uh, finds very alluring. Okay, let's, let me start with the canto. Uh, the canto start, starts with uh, uh, another uh, very topical relation, a uh, very topical allusion. Dante is uh, drawing our attention to a specific place, to the city of Florence. It is as if he wants to uh, moor himself, anchor himself to something as concrete as his immediate, uh, with, uh, immediate place, uh, his own native place. And, 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 and it's an apostrophe to Florence. Rejoice, Florence, since thou art so great. Let me just stop here a moment. Pay attention as you read the canto. Pay attention to one uh, stylistic element. The antithetical, the antithetical uh, use of great or la uh, tall and small at the same time. Uh, rhetorically sometimes, uh, or even with the idea that, uh, uh, of, of making us ask and wonder what is the relationship between, between that which claims to be so large and so big and that which claims to be so small. Ulysses obviously thinks of himself in terms of loftiness. And Dante now rhetorically starts with Florence, since thou so great, the satire is obvious, that over land and sea thou beatest thy wings, and through hell thy name is spread abroad. The whole point is that he has seen some Florentine thieves, unnamed even. Among the thieves I found five such citizens of thine, that shame for them comes. And, and once again, the prophetic voice of Dante appears here. And that we will see that this is, is fairly important in the narrative. We set out, second paragraph, and on the stairs which the projecting rocks had made for a descent before, my leader mounted again and drew me up and following the lonely way among the rocks and splinters of the ridge, the foot made no speed without the hand. I grieved then, and grieve now anew. Then, when he was a pilgrim, watching and witnessing the stories that he's going to tell. And now, as a writer, there's a double focus that Dante is using. Uh, the focus of the, the pilgrim and the focus of the narrator. I grieve then and I grieve now anew when I turn my mind to what I saw. And more than I want, I curb my powers. And this is going to be at least the attempt of Dante to curb his powers as he witnesses the story of immoderate hunger for knowledge, of a flight of the mind. That's what we have here, the flight of the mind which is like the, the flight of Daedalus, which is like the flight of Icarus, that seems to know no boundaries. Ulysses is he who transgresses all boundaries. But doesn't Dante also transgress boundaries? He won't say so here. 
he wants, it seems that he takes Ulysses as a, an exemplary figure that would lead him to want to curb his powers. Let's continue. Uh, 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 lest, uh, uh, lest they run where virtue does not guide them. Uh, and the language is that of uh, horses, of course. Horses, the, f the horses of the soul. And virtue is the ability to hold the black and the white horse of the chariot, uh, to, uh, to hold them together. And so that's the allusion with, with the, the, that Dante is using in your platonic language. So that if favoring star or something better have granted me such a boon, I may not grudge it to, to myself. And now the first description of the landscape, a summer landscape, as many as the fireflies, which the peasant resting on the hill in the season when he that lights the world least hides his face from us. What an extraordinary image. A periphrasis to talk about the sun. It's then the night when the sun is hiding. And you'll see the implications of this metaphor, I hope, in a moment. Sees along the valley below, in the fields, perhaps where he gathers the grapes and tills with so many flames, the eighth ditch was all gleaming as I perceived as soon as I came where the bottom was in sight. And this he, that I was avenged by the bears, so the chariot of Elijah at his departure, when the horses reared the rose to heaven, who could not follow it with his eyes so as to see anything but the flame alone, like a little cloud mounting up. So each flame moves along the gullet of the ditch, for none shows the theft, and everyone steals away a sinner. Uh, Dante is not comparing himself to Elijah. He's comparing to someone who watches Elijah. Elijah, who is also engaged in a flight, to a flight of the soul, right? Exactly like Ulysses, who is going to be represented as is the antithesis to Ulysses. But Dante is neither like Elijah, and he would like us to believe that he's not really like Ulysses. He is like Eliseus, the one who inherits the mantle of prophecy from Elijah, and the one though, who witnesses, watches. It's, a, it's, it's, it's his way of, of trying to avoid the extreme of the prophet, and now, as it turns out, the rhetorician. This is, this is the way the layout here is between Ulysses and, uh, and Elijah. And so I was standing on the bridge, and then he goes on. He's told that within the flames are the spirits. This is a fog flame, and there are two souls. Di uh, Ulysses and Diomede. Pay attention to this little detail, except in the case of the, uh, the, the suicides, Dante always sees pairs of sinners. Here is Diomede who doesn't talk, and he sees also uh, he sees, uh, Ulysses. And I suppose that the reason is that Dante really wants us to know about the social quality of a, a, a moral violation. That a moral violation always implies uh, somebody else. It's not quite ever, except for the suicide, which has a peculiar form, because you have witness, homicide, and victim all in one. But in, in, uh, in, in the other sinners, you always have a sense of uh, 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 an, a, a witness, somebody else who has been touched or an accomplice of, uh, of, of, of the sinner. Uh, so within, we know that now he answered, who are these people? I already wish to ask thee, who is that fire who, which comes so cloven at the top that seems to rise from the fire where Eteocles was led with his brother? The story is that abide, the, f the two brothers were enemies, Eteocles and Polynes. Thebes, it's, uh, we already have an introduction of, this is all about Greek mythology. Uh, in Greek mythology, with brothers, the city of uh, the story of Thebes, which Dante knows through Statius, uh, the idea of Oedipus, of course, and Jocasta, and the tragic city. Uh, the, the Thebes becomes the, uh, the term, becomes the metaphor, the, 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 the basic metaphor of uh, this, um, uh, of the tragic city, uh, because in effect, presents also, one of the reasons that for Dante is crucial, it presents birth, Eteocles and Polynes, um, the, child's, the children of Oedipus <coughs> and Jocasta, as tragic events. 
this is something that distinguishes radically the Greek idea, as Dante understands it, uh, the Greek idea of cities and birth from, say, Virgil's idea of birth, you know, that's something to be celebrated all the time. Dan uh, Virgil is always the one who celebrates uh, the birth of uh, Asinius, Polio, etc. Now we know who these are. He answered me, within there are tormented, within there are tormented Ulysses and Diomed, and thus together they go under vengeance, as under wrath, etc. If they're able to speak within these lights, I said, I earnestly pray thee, Master, and pray again that my prayer avail a thousandfold that thou do not forbid me to stay till the horned flame comes near. Thou seest how I bend toward it with desire. And he said, thy prayer deserves much praise, therefore I consent to it. But do not restrain thy tongue. First, a little earlier, he wanted to curb his powers. Now Virgil asks him to restrain his tongue. Leave it to me to speak, for I have understood what thou wishest. For perhaps, since they were Greeks, they would disdain my speech. So we have really uh, a sense of a hierarchy of styles. Virgil and Ulysses, and then in Canto 27, it's going to be Guido da Montefeltro and Dante. Uh, or you were two, who are two within one fire. If I deserved you where I lived, if I deserved you much or little, once again, the oscillation between high and low, much or little, when in the world I wrote the lofty lines, do not move on, but let the one of you tell where being lost he went to die. The greater horn of the ancient flame began to toss a murmur, just as if it were beaten by the wind. Then waving the point to and fro as it were the tongue that spoke, it flung forth a voice and said, when I parted from Circe, who held me more than a year, near Gaeta, before Aeneas, so named it. So you see clearly Ulysses tells his story through the myth of Aeneas, claiming priority over Aeneas, but also acknowledging one thing. It's an incredibly, I find it a very moving line that uh, Aeneas names places in memory of his nurse. You know, he names the city of Gaeta. He's a founder of cities and names the city of Gaeta, not fondness for a son, not duty to an aged father, not the love I owed Penelope. Look at this, what we call heavily ethical language. Ulysses speaks in terms of what his duties are, fondness for a son, the duty to an aged father, Laertes, the love I owed Penelope, which should have gladdened her, could conquer within me the passion I had to gain experience of the world, and the vices and worth of men. This is, seems to be an ethical quest, and nothing can stand in the way of this virtuous action. Ulysses thinks of himself as a virtuous quester after vices, understanding, and gaining experience of, uh, of vices and, uh, and, and, and virtues and the worth of men. And I put forth on the open deep with but one ship, uh, the one shore and the other I saw as far as Spain, Morocco, Sardinia. Uh, and he's a man of, who mentions places all the time, this narrative. He always mentions places, cities, Morocco, uh, Seville, Ceuta on the other side of the Mediterranean. Um, it is as if here is a man who lives in space. He left his father, left his son, that would be a temporal description of him, but he really lives in space because it is as if he never really knew his own place in the world. He's always looking for something. He doesn't even, he doesn't know where he, 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 he belongs. And, and I, my companions were old and slow when we came to that narrow outlet where Hercules set up his landmarks so that men should not pass beyond. On my right hand, I left Seville. On the other, I already left Ceuta. And now the speech he makes to his own companions. And look at the rhetorical, the rhetorical wisdom with which he moves. He addresses them as brothers, which is the biggest captatio benevolence. We're all together. There is no hierarchy here. I'm not your leader. I'm not your king. Or oh, brothers, I said, who threw a hundred thousand perils. Look at the hyperboles. You know, if you want to seduce uh, 
people to come, companions to come with you. You have to tell them that they are mighty actions, and he does, and then magnify all the possible dangers. 100,000 perils have reached the West. Not a definite place, the West. Vague and yet lofty uh, to this so brief vigil of the senses. So the modesty, the oscillation between hyperbole and, and, and uh, the lightote, as it were, the, 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 the recoiling into the, the sense of ordinariness and small that remains to us. Choose not to deny experience, which I find an extraordinary word, experience, and I probably will uh, uh, stop here with this. Experience, as you know, is a word made only of prepositions. Uh, ex per ira, it's a journey, it's a going uh, through, uh, per, no, experience. It's understood as a journey. It is as if knowledge, that's what it, the, the etymology of the word is. It's a going through, uh, as if knowledge literally is compared to a displacement, to a traveling, uh, through, through a, a, a catabasis even in this case, which is the, the, the term to indicate the descent into you know, the beyond. In the sun's tracks of the unpeopled world, take thought of the seed from which you spring. If you want to know the end of things, you have to know the beginning. You have to know the seed. Huh? Uh, this is the, the this is Ulysses' perception, uh, and because you have a noble seed, then you do know that you are. There's a kind of natural determination in his own uh, his own mind uh, that he will reach indeed the noble end. You were not born to live as brutes, but to follow virtue and knowledge. That's an extraordinary, extraordinary line. Uh, he promises that human beings will leave behind, well, the allusion may be to the metamorphosis of Circe that had changed the companions into pigs, right? The, the Epicureans, the hogs of Epicurus, into the voluptuary experiences. And he promises to restore in them, not only the human image, but to bring them to uh, virtual knowledge. And it's an extraordinary promise. It's a very difficult promise. It's almost an impossible promise. It may even not be a correct promise because he's making a promise that virtue is knowledge. I lead you to virtue and knowledge, and they may not be the same thing. I may have knowledge, but it doesn't mean that I have the virtue of that, that I claim to have knowledge about. And my, 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 it can be anything, anything at all. I can know what prudence is, it doesn't, that doesn't really make me prudent. That's, so let's stop here, I want to stop here and um, want to see if there are some questions uh, and then resume next time with uh, the canto. Yes? The question is, uh, I, I mentioned, uh, actually Ulysses mentions, knowing that he speaks to Virgil, mentions Aeneas. And, uh, uh, so that's the answer, that's why Aeneas and Ulysses, vaguely. That's, uh, uh, they clearly were fighting the same battle in Troy. V Virg uh, Ulysses must know uh, that Aeneas had lost his hometown and he took his son, unlike Ulysses, he took his father on, uh, on, on his, his back, uh, literally, the, he's the immigrant, and his son and uh, lost his wife, Creusa, and goes looking for a place, without really knowing what a place is for him. Ulysses knows where he wants to go. He has a certain idea of his destination, which is Ithaca. He has a lot of temptations along the way. Nausicaa, and what a temptation. Uh, Circe, another great temptation. He manages to move beyond those temptations in order to go back to Ithaca. That's the great difference from, from the Roman myth of the immigrant. Exactly, absolutely. So there is a, the, the difference between them uh, becomes that, you, that Aeneas will stop at one point. 
uh, he has temptations to stop in Sicily. Uh, you remember the, 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 the famous games, uh, the games, ritual games, in memory of his father who had died, the death that hallows that ground, uh, the death of, 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 of Anchises. The women burn the ships. This is, this is too, too, this is utopia. I don't, we don't want to go around into this epic adventure. Let's stop here. He won't. He's always misunderstanding oracles. He doesn't know where to go. He's always looking backwards, but looking forward at the same time. But at one point, he stops. He and, and that's part of, if you wish, the, the realism of, of Aeneas. He stops at one point. He, cannot, he will not go any, any further. Ulysses goes back home, and then he starts all over again. But that's Dante's reading of Ulysses. Okay? So he's really reading him as very much like uh, as if it were a, a variant of, uh, of Dante, in other way. Uh, yes? Uh, uh, the question is very interesting, and it's, is it possible to think of uh, Aeneas and Ulysses as a two functions, as it were, of Dante, the pilgrim and the poet. Uh, yes and no. Um, it's a very interesting question. Um, but I, I would not, um, I, I, I really hesitate to agree with you for one reason. Uh, because writing for Dante is a prolongation of, of the search. Dante literally cannot stop. It's not that, you know, he, on, on the face of it, he has seen the beatific vision, right? That's really the story, the story of a man who goes from the wilderness, goes through hell, purgatory, paradise, and has a beatific vision, and now he starts telling us about it, uh, fighting against forgetfulness. The, you know, he has a lot of, as a writer, he has a lot of temptation. And yet, the writing itself is fraught with, with uh, dangers, temptations. It's a different sort of journey, but it's the journey of writing. And therefore, there's no clear-cut distinction between the two. In fact, I just gave, read in Canto 25 uh, the little scene when he challenges Lucan and Ovid, which really is uh, let the past yield to the present. You know, that, that, that's really the kind of claim that they can make. Uh, let them be quiet. I know what is happening. And, and the story is that as a writer, he is uh, lapsing, he's falling into a number of temptations as if he were a pilgrim. You can expect that from a pilgrim, to being, fa being fascinated by, uh, by Francesca, um, having all these uh, inner divisions. Dante is a, a deeply divided man. He has to condemn and at the same time has to sympathize as, as, uh, even as a pilgrim. So that's really it. That's, that's the only little detail where I would, uh, uh, I would not agree with you, but maybe you're right. I don't know. Uh, yes? He returned. Uh, the, the, the question is, can I speak about how Dante changes the ending of Ulysses' story? And the answer is this. Uh, Dante makes Ulysses go back to Ithaca, but then he breaks the circle of this closed circle. Let's call it the circle of the epic. Let me talk formally about it. You know, the, the idea is that you, uh, what, what are some traits of the epic? The epics deal with foundations of cities and destruction of cities all the time, no matter what that city may be. So he has destroyed the city, goes back to, uh, to his own city to cleanse it. That's, uh, that, you know, which is Homer's way of saying, I think, uh, you Greeks were so, so great when you were out into the world at Troy. Let us see how that heroic ethos is going to help you that you are back home, whether probably you are going to need more courage and more determination, as much courage at least, as, as much determination as you did have uh, in, in that great celebration of the newly found Greek unity uh, in, in Asia Minor, in, in, in Troy. 
So that's that. Now Dante takes that, and he says, no, there's no closure here, because he rejects the idea of Dante. To the epic, he replaces the epic with the novel. This becomes a kind of novelistic story, where is where wherein. Uh, experience is being arrived at as one goes. You see what I'm saying? In the epic, you have a kind of, uh, indeed, things return to the point of, uh, of departure. Uh, that's, so that's the difference. It's a difference between two radically different ways of understanding experience and the self. Dante will put himself on the open road, but Ulysses will remain the constant reminder to him. He is the phantasm he can never quite exercise. It will return to him, as I said. When a siren appears and tempts the pilgrim and says, look, I made, I gave happiness to Ulysses. Why don't you stay with me? And the implication is, first of all, she's lying, uh, because this is uh, you know, the story of uh, Ulysses putting the, the wax in his ears is uh, nicely omitted, but it's a way, a temptation to Dante to feel that he too is an epic hero, like Ulysses. Okay. Did I answer? Other questions? We'll come back to this canto, which is uh, truly um, uh, plays a, a, a crucial role in Dante's imagination and in the, in the divine comedy, the, the unfolding of the divine comedy. So, uh, read carefully, and then we'll go on to the other campus. Thank you.